synonymous with the 80s, having a triple platinum album, and of course, frontman D. Snyder stuck it to Congress as well as the PMRC. Having sold millions of records during that decade, you'd think frontman D. Snyder would have been rolling in money. Well, he wasn't. By the early to mid 90s, with the rise of alternative music and changing musical trends, the frontman was broke and he had a great deal of business setbacks and just plain bad luck. In today's video, let's explore how D. Snyder went bankrupt not once, but twice, and what happened to him. Twisted Sister were coming off the success of their third record, Stay Hungry, which would produce two huge hits in We're Not Gonna Take It and I Wanna Rock. They were about to release their fourth record, Come Out and Play, and there were big expectations that this album would sell well. Expecting a huge reception to their new record, the band designed a pretty elaborate and expensive stage setup for the tour. Then release day came and weeks came and went, and the album proved to be a commercial disappointment, only going gold, selling about a sixth of what its predecessor did. The tour wasn't much better either. Despite garnering a ton of press coverage, frontman D. Snyder soon realized that the press attention had more to do with the PMRC than his band's music. Despite playing a few sold out shows in the Northeast, once Twisted Sister left that region, the ticket sales plummeted. Despite touring with Dawkin, they weren't selling out shows and frequently playing to half sold out venues. D would add in his book that the set list the band also chose for the tour were equally bad, choosing heavier songs and ditching those more pop metal tunes. He would write in his book, they wanted to hear fun, funny songs, Twisted Sister's core audience was gone. D would also go on to theorize in his book that the band represented everything wrong with rock and parents forbade their kids from even attending their shows only further, of course, hurting ticket sales. A month into the tour, the band was bleeding money and had to cut their losses, so they scrapped the rest of the North American dates of the tour, and to shield themselves from the humiliation of low ticket sales, D would admit in his book that he faked a throat polyp, and the band soon found themselves deep in debt. Soon enough, Atlantic Records, their label, pulled the plug on promoting the album, despite some bigger crowds in Europe attending their shows there. The final straw for the label came when MTV banned the video for their third single due to what the network claimed was horrific content. D would reveal in his book, to me that was the final nail in the coffin of our career. He would go on to reveal the true reality of the band's finances up until this point, writing, when you don't break until your third or fourth album, you're in debt to your record company for all the recording budgets, videos, tour support, and whatever other they can charge against your account. That has accumulated over the years. You're in debt, baby. One big selling record only serves to pay it back. You need to sustain your career to make money, he would write. D would also clarify in his book that he didn't spend money on drugs, alcohol, and that he wasn't ripped off by management or the label. He would even ask the question, why didn't he curb his spending to adjust for his decreased income? Well, he writes quite frequently in his book that his ego wouldn't let him. He still believed that despite the setback the band was facing at the time, it was only going to be temporary. While Twisted Sister took a break, D would set out to record a solo record that was more pop influenced, initially taking inspiration from Brian Adams. He would also nab a spot hosting the precursor to Headbangers Ball on MTV, a show called Heavy Metal Mania, but he would eventually leave the show after about a year feeling too overexposed and due to the fact that MTV was notoriously cheap and didn't even pay him. His management and label urged him to make his solo record the next Twisted Sister album, which he agreed to do. Twisted Sister would release their fifth record, Love is for Suckers, in 1987. It would represent a more commercial direction that D wanted to go in his solo record. The band also brought in more outside musicians, toned down their heavy makeup image, and tried to blend in with other popular acts at the time. But the album didn't get the support it needed from Atlantic, and MTV didn't really push the singles. Producer Bo Hill, who worked on the album, would famously say, I went looking for the record in stores and found one copy under a half-eaten hamburger in the stockroom. The tour to support the record was limited and canceled due to weak ticket sales once again, and by October of 87, D. Snyder announced that he was leaving the band due to rising internal tensions. He soon came to the realization that living large and surviving paycheck to paycheck for years and years was eventually going to catch up. In the past, every time he needed money, 
he'd always get money loaned to him or he'd get an advance since there was this idea that Twisted Sister would either come back or continue to have success. Then there was a deal that the band had with a merchandiser named Winterland who advanced the band $1 million. Winterland soon came knocking asking to be repaid and they wanted Dee to repay the whole debt amount since he made the most money in the band. He would remark in his book, if they insisted that I pay the entire million dollar debt, I would fall for bankruptcy and they would get nothing. To this, Winterland responded they wanted it all from me, and they didn't care if I went bankrupt and they got nothing. They wanted to make an example of Twisted Sister. As Dee picked up the pieces of his career, he hooked up with former Aussie guitarist Bernie Torme. All while this was happening, he finally declared bankruptcy, a word that may be scary to a lot of people, but he would be quick to point out that there's two types of bankruptcy, one for rich people and one for poor people. While D. Snyder didn't have cash, he had assets, like music publishing, his house, his cars. By hiring the best bankruptcy law firm, he was able to get back on his feet while keeping his assets and barely losing anything in the process, including not having to pay back that $1 million to Winterland. Things were suddenly looking up for D as his new band with Bernie Torme titled Desperado, which also included ex-Iron Maiden, Skin Batcher, Clive Burr, and bassist Mark Russell, started to get attention from record labels, ultimately signing with Elektra. But the time it took to actually sign the paperwork resulted in D falling on hard financial times once again, as he had to foot the bills for the band and his members. By the time the deal was actually signed, the advance he received wasn't enough to recoup his expenses. Then came the devastating news that as the band was ready to release their debut album, Electra suspended Desperado's contract and the album would be shelved. It turned out that the A&R guy who signed Desperado quit and took a job at a rival label and in an act of revenge, Atlantic dropped all the bands that A&R guy was working with. In a financial pinch, D would have to sell his house and relocate to Florida where he could live for cheaper. Making matters worse, the band was stuck in the recording contract and couldn't go elsewhere unless they paid back the full amount of their deal, which is about half a million dollars. But then something strange happened. An old acquaintance named Rick Wake, who was a recording engineer back in the day, now owned his own studio and became a powerful mover and shaker in the music business. He had known Dee Snyder for quite a while and he was able to introduce the frontman to his lawyer, who made one phone call and got him out of his recording contract with Elektra. It turned out the lawyer did a lot of business with Elektra and the frontman was now free to record for whoever and even take his Desperado album to another label. Then after some lineup changes, Desperado would eventually morph into another band named Widowmaker, which signed to an indie label which released the group's debut album in 1992. Their album sold a respectable 50,000 copies by the end of the year, but then trouble struck once again. It turned out the Canadian government seized the label's assets after they raised money in some questionable ways. The band was done, and Dee was forced to move out of his rental in Florida and downsize to a rental in Long Island. Soon enough, his family was burning through their retirement income and selling their possessions. His wife would get a job working at a salon, while Dee would ride his bike for kilometers a day to get to work at his brother's office where he answered phones, made calls, and did some bookkeeping. He was making about five bucks an hour, and this was around 1995. But he still wasn't bringing in enough money, and he had to declare bankruptcy a second time. This time around, he didn't have the funds or assets to hire the best bankruptcy attorneys. Things got so bad, he couldn't even afford to buy his kids a piece of candy, but as the decade went on and throughout the 2000s, he was able to get radio jobs, voiceover work, and appeared on Broadway, and of course, Twisted Sister Reunited, turning his financial situation